good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining us today um, at the session on responsible business equals successful business mainstreaming the dignity and equity of uh, all workers in india um, thank you to sankalp uh, for giving us the opportunity to bring this session to you today um, the pandemic last year and the resulting exodus of millions of people uh, from our cities which included men women and children in tow was not just a clarion call to our philanthropies it was in fact a wake up call to our systems uh, systems of our nation that have become complacent with treating the 300 million people at the bottom of india's pyramid uh, as a case for arms rather than as fellow citizens and fellow workers that deserve the dignity equity and opportunities that are due to any human being uh um, today's session therefore speaks about mainstreaming the perspective interests and well-being of these invisible workers and individuals into our key systems and particularly focuses on industry as a key system that can mainstream those who are informally engaged within it uh within its value chains its business chains add value to the business but are rarely uh, added value to or valued enough uh, by by these uh business chains before we kick off the conversation uh there is nothing better than hearing from the workers themselves so i'd request for us to play the video please घर जाने के लिए भी कहता पच्चीस सौ रुपया टिकट पच्चीस सौ रुपया बीवी में पाँच हजार रुपया हम कहाँ से लाएंगे कंपनी कुछ भी नहीं करेगा मेरा हंड्रेड परसेंट विश्वास है कंपनी कुछ भी नहीं करेगा मेरे लिए क्योंकि कंपनी के चाहिए एक अच्छे वर्कर चाहिए जिसको सारी चाहती है और हम लोग तो सर प्रेशर हैं प्रेशर को कुछ भी करता नहीं ज़्यादा ज़्यादा हेल्प ही करेगा वो भी बोलेगा रहो डेढ़ दिन रहे तुम्हारा साल में एक हज़ार डेढ़ हज़ार रुपया सर इनक्रीज करता है उससे क्या होगा औरतों को कम से कम खाली सिर्फ चार हज़ार हज़ार मिलते हैं और आदमी को आठ हज़ार दस तो ये सही है और इतना मजदूरी करके भी इंसान देख के बात करते हैं वहाँ पे अगर हमारे जैसे हैं तो तीन हज़ार साढ़े तीन हज़ार और काम तो इतना होता है कि एक सेकेंड भी हम इधर से उधर नहीं हो सकते एक सेकेंड इंसान से बात भी नहीं कर सकते कहीं बाहर जा नहीं सकते वो लोग हाथ खड़ा करें जिनके कंपनियों में सेफ्टी के ऊपर मिलते ही नहीं है हमारा नाम मोहन पासवान है हमको सर दो बार पाँव पर इसमें चोट लग चुकी है हाथ में समझिए हमारे बंदे के और लगे हमारे कंपनी में पाँच बंदे को शाम को चार बजे मेरे काम करते समय उसमें मशीन में हाथ चला गया था अब मेरा जो हाथ अभी फिंगल भी नहीं मूवमेंट हो रहा है और यहाँ से वर्किंग नहीं हो रहा है बराबर खाना भी नहीं खा पाती हूँ मैं इससे बाकी उसमें बहुत सारी प्रॉब्लम थी काम करने में केमिकल डालना सांस लेने में प्रॉब्लम आती थी जैसे कलर्स उड़ता है ना जैसे अपने मिट्टी उड़ती जैसे कलर उड़ता था उसमें भी प्रॉब्लम होती थी सांस लेने में सौकड़े की सवारी है कि हर बंदे को छोट लग जा रही है आगे चल के बंदे को निकाल दिया जा रहा है कंपनी से उसके बाद में दो चार महीना रखने के बाद में बोलता है कि तुम जाओ भागो फिर काम तुमको कहीं ढूंढो दूसरा कंपनी रखती नहीं सर यही मेरा लड़के ही एक बार बीमार पड़ा था तो कम से कम तो अठारह हजार रुपया प्राइवेट में दिया डेंगो मलेरिया की वजह से मगज में बुखार पकड़ लिया था तो अठारह हजार रुपया लगाया सरकारी दवाखाने में जाते हैं वहाँ पे भी भटकना पड़ता है ई का कार्ड है लेकिन वहाँ पे भी जाओ तो दस धक्का तो खाना पड़ता है यहाँ से सीधे बापू बापू नगर 
से आओ अब छोटा तो हमारा पूरा महीना डेढ़ महीना अगर बीमार पड़ गए तो तीन चार महीना भी बिगड़ जाता है फिर यहाँ पर आओ तो हड्डी देख कर तब जाकर नौकरी पर लेते हैं क्या क्या पुरावे हैं आपके पास यहाँ गुजरात के कोई पुरावे हैं गुजरात तो पुरा कहीं नहीं है जैसे दवाखाना नके न कागल छोटा मोटा राकेला है यही थे तो आपने जो मजदूर जो काम करते हैं उनके बीमे वगैरह करवाते हैं क्या बीमा वगैरह करा ही पुनः करवाना बीमे वगैरह बीमे के बारे में आपको जानकारी जानकारी नहीं है हम बता रहे हैं कि मतलब हम लोग को ना कुछ राशन मिलता है न तो घर इंदिरा आवास मिला है हम लोग भी कोशिश कर रहे हैं लेकिन हम लोग कुछ कर नहीं पा रहे हैं क्योंकि हम लोग अनपढ़ हैं और गरीब हैं तो हम लोग को बात को कोई नहीं रख रहा तो हम लोग अभी तक तो पैसा रख नहीं पाए हैं कुछ हाँ। पैसा उसा हो जाएगा तो कुछ आगे धंधा देखेंगे भट्टा इट्ठा ये कमाना छोड़ देंगे हाँ। और बाल बच्चा को पढ़ाएंगे लिखाएंगे और मैं सारा मेहनत हम करेंगे अब तो लेकिन अभी खाने के लिए भी नहीं है तो फिर क्या करें Malini, I'd like to begin our conversation today with you. Uh, what happened last year? We hit rock bottom. I mean, who are these people? You know, what what just happened overnight when the pandemic struck? So, uh, one, I will talk about what happened to them in pen during pandemic. We had uh, we work with about twenty six thousand families um, who are. in a uh, way speaking profession and uh, they are um, and also we work with lot of uh, labor migrant labor and what we have seen is uh, in way speaking community not many people migrated out of bangalore but all the rest of the uh, families did migrate so this clearly showed organizing getting people together tell telling them you are a migrant but you are part of us is the key uh we we have to say so let me talk a little bit about this sector itself waste pickers and uh, informal waste working sector you know with swachh bharat abhiyan global crisis for plastic pollution attention to ocean plastic emphasis on secular economy has resulted in lot of entrepreneurs mushrooming across the world and uh, in india on waste management and recycling business they have a great noble objective of uh, this uh, social enterprise to manage environment work and uh, very little em emphasis is given on uh, waste workers or any other workers in the waste supply chain and uh, and this i'm sharing what we have done and uh, as an organization what we are looking at so most of the new entrepreneurs in this sector say they have given social security like esi and p we have to so many so they are so much better off you know uh, as waste pickers but i would like to state that this is not a social protection you are giving this is only a social security that is given to any worker and is being compliant to the law so when you are looking at business and especially social impact entrepreneurs they have to go beyond uh, this and recognize the the skill they have knowledge they have as you were saying and also the film showed we just look at them as workers but we never look at them as um, the knowledge uh, partners uh, people who have skill that is a main issue and during the pandemic and post pandemic we are seeing this happen again and again so waste pickers are in this business over centuries and uh, what uh, we throw as waste through their labor in sorting and grading they create a tradable commodity you know and uh, and this is the truth and they have 
everybody has to recognize this. So they're innate entrepreneurs. They know if I have to pay fee for my school uh, of my child, I know which road to go, which what time to go, where to sell it. And so this is the quality of entrepreneurs, which is already there. Of course, during, during pandemic, there was nothing on the street. They were scared. They didn't want to touch it. For almost two, two and a half months, they lived on either, um, uh, uh, you know, ration given by some of us, like some of us. And of course, people who had ration card were way better than people in the migrants who didn't have any kind of entitlement. That is what we have seen. And uh, these are the people who have kept our city clean, especially when the services of the city is uh, so poor uh, for waste management. These people have kept this clean, kept the city clean. Our people continue to work in collection of dry waste during the pandemic, but they didn't get any kind of benefit from the government or anybody else. And uh, so when you really look, we have to look at their contribution, forget about what happened, but why can't we recognize what they have? See, we did a study with, with about 15,000 waste pickers, which showed that if they save about 84 crores annually, just in collection and transportation, then what are they getting from the city or from the entrepreneurs? Nothing. So recognizing that they have a knowledge, they have a strength, and they're positively contributing to the economy is the first basic thing we have to learn. If we learn that and provide the support, only then can we expect a crisis like uh, the pandemic that we have gone through, they can survive. So, um, so we also want to understand what this profession, how did they come into this, this particular thing? See, they're always running from some um, issue or the other to come to the city. So most of these people are Dalits in Karnataka. And also we have seen a lot of uh, nomadic tribes who settled in Karnataka um, and took up uh, recycling as their business. We do see a lot of tribes in, in cities of Rajasthan who are coming from displaced, if displaced uh, because of forest uh, laws. And in some cities of Maharashtra, you see Mangan Matar communities in this place who during the uh, great uh, famine in Marathwada, they all moved to this place. And we have many Assamis in Bangalore and other cities who are evicted because of the floods. So we have a huge community from West Bengal, Delhi and Bangalore, and the list goes on. So if they're already running away from some kind of a calamity to look at their lives in cities and there is a pandemic and you don't provide services, where do they go? There's nowhere to go also. Um, if they don't, some of the Assamese says our, our villages are not there anymore. Uh, it's all gone. So it, it's very difficult uh, uh, for, for them to survive them. So, um, um, so, and also because this waste uh, picking doesn't have employee-employer relationship, when they come to the city, they recognize uh, it's very easy to get into this. They don't need any reference to get into the job. The, in the film, you were saying, we are newcomers, nobody takes our jobs, right? So this is an opportunity and they get into it. And uh, it's predominantly women in this particular thing. And I can tell you, women has faced a lot of issues during the pandemic, including family violence, domestic violence, and children. We have seen a lot of reports on uh, child abuse increase, but there was nowhere to go to support. Forget about all that. Even the, uh, the PHC, uh, which is supposed to give primary health care, was closed because they were servicing only uh, people with uh, COVID. So where should they go? They go to local pharmacy that was closed. They cannot go there without a prescription. They would go to local quacks. They have all closed up. It's not like I'm promoting quacks, but there was no access to them during this pandemic, especially women and children. So there are many people, as I said, there was no social security or social entitlement at all. I'm sure the next uh, person who's going to speak will talk about what is the issue. Anyway, migrants don't get any, uh, any um, uh, social entitlement because if yeah. you have social entitlement, at least there is something that you can bring to the table in, the, in your home, especially if you have yeah. issues. That is yeah. not there, right? So... Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so 
these are all skill labor. We also have to recognize their skill when you're working with them. So they are skill labor and uh, they can sort and grade, uh, you know, plastic into 74 categories, which none of us can do. Even I can't do even after working in, uh, 25 years in this sector. And uh, again, the paper, they, they do it. And what we are really looking at is not look at them as labor moving forward. Look at them as people with skill. Leverage their entrepreneurial, uh, you know, skills, and yeah. uh, and also treat them as semi-skilled labor, not make them day wage labor with ESI and PF. There is so much of loss of, uh, you know, um, the talent in the in the country. So we have seen in Bangalore, we have done uh, work, and these are all um, uneducated people. Now we have made about yeah. 120 waste pickers as entrepreneurs who are filing their income taxes. Some of them registered as MSNE, and uh, they are also paying ESIPF to their workers. So we have to really um, look at how to make this happen, how to rebuild. Don't let us not rebuild the businesses as usual as laborers, but leverage them and use them as partners in our work. And uh, so uh, there are, as I said, they're predominantly uh, women uh, in the sector. And I've just shared my story of working with uh, waste pickers. But when you look at any kind of sector, whether it is brick cleans, what we saw, or construction workers, they have a similar story, similar uh, skill set. And we have to be conscious and humble enough to learn from the workers and take them as entrepreneurs. What we need is a business with values. So that is what yeah. we have to look to make it different. And what we have seen in pandemic has very clearly say that uh, the businesses are not uh, looking at uh, sustainable um, human capital uh, support. So that is what uh, we have to look forward to. Thank you, that. Nalini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Aniket, I, Nalini spoke about invisible and moving. How do you service such a population? So, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Zuni. I think uh, this is probably, I mean, in India, just to state some, adding to some of the points that Nalili also shared. Overall, there are peop about 800 million people who are eligible for a ration grant to begin with, right? So, that we are talking about migrants, construction workers, factory workers who are eligible for schemes. And let's let's just see, like, because at Hadarshad, we only work on government schemes. And I think in the last now eight years that I've been doing this, uh, I've identified that uh, the main problem is information, right? I mean, all of us in the group wouldn't know what schemes are there. There are 7,500 schemes on our platform. And every scheme has a different eligibility criteria. Eligibility criteria of schemes is based on caste, income, domicile, gender, breadwinner of the family, which under constitution is assumed to be a man. That's why the disparity between gender it's, itself. So these are how schemes are determined. And while getting government entitlements to people is also a technology challenge. And that's why we built the entire product using technology. I always feel that government entitlements is a political challenge. Who designs schemes? It's the political representatives, right? Like when you have elections, there are promises. All promises are government schemes. There are elected representatives who push this uh, year on year uh, financial year wise. So I think identifying of these workers in terms of data registry, in terms of identification has come up, especially during COVID as the main issue. I think no state or central government really has a repository. And that's why we are seeing now platforms like One Nation, One Russian Card, which basically was after the uh, embarrassing situation that as country people that we saw last year, where our fellow country men and women were going back uh, on foot, hungry, uh, back to their villages. While there were 792 million ration cards issued, they were not issued, they were not active for the workers who were in metro cities working in factories. That is because there is an issue of domicile. If I am from Jharkhand and I'm working in Gurgaon, I can only use in the previous uh, regime, I mean, in the previous model, my ration card in Jharkhand. Delhi or Gurgaon is not going to really give me ration because I'm not their voter. So it doesn't work on a citizen basis, the entire identification of migrants, the entire identification of labor, it works on state level politics. So I think we really need to identify the main kind of lever of government schemes, entitlements is political 
push political design uh, how schemes are promised and how entitlements happen i think from a, from our perspective like i said we have looked at the technology uh, platform and service delivery angle because i do believe technology is really really important to scale uh, but technology is not the solution and solution it's a means to the end it should be used uh, accordingly uh, we've now been working with about 100000 families a month uh, we were working about 5000 families a year till about 18 months and now we work about with about 100000 construction workers factory workers a month and the model that we deploy for example the other thing that we have really seen work is that who delivers the message of schemes and who helps in applications and there we train local women because i also believe that in social protection and government schemes the messenger is more important than the message uh, the government entitlement space has been so uh, in a way uh, uh, dominated by the political representatives agents who have misinformed people in the past taken money for simple things like caste certificate and other things that it's very important that a local person informs and becomes the agent of change and i think that's where it also is very important and the other thing that i would really want to focus on and bring out is that the three steps of government entitlements for these uh, like it's mentioned like how to identify them which who are these people i think first is just the registration and the data around well, how do you identify a migrant in what category because all of us are urban migrants it's just that we are upper middle income upper middle income but all of us are in some way or the other urban migrant so how do you how do you identify them then how do you get the information because information like i believe is the key the third big thing more than government entitlements is documentation uh, getting somebody a caste certificate income certificate can be game changing in terms of them getting then then entitlement or even getting their land rights in a rural area or getting multiple other things so how do you work on effective scaled up documentation which is in place at the right time a quick example apart from jandhan is the atmanirbhar program under which 10000 rupees were to be given to women who had jandhan accounts but jandhan accounts about 78% of them were inactive and the ones who had them active couldn't access the cash uh, by going to an atm uh, so i think these are some of the challenges and then like i said once you get even the government entitlement the other big piece is the grievance redressal how do you get the information go because uh, we work with multiple stakeholders across schemes um, like i mentioned about you know 7500 schemes out of which about 1000 plus are unique and things even like entitlements like pensions scholarships bocw construction card and other schemes the challenge is that once you get the scheme right i mean then how do you ensure that they keep getting the benefit lot of times you have to every year people have to ensure their income certificate is in place you have to prove if you're getting pension that you're alive after 3 years otherwise if you're not active in the system government assumes you're dead so these are some of the challenges that i feel are linked to how do we identify and kind of you know ensure that the the, the whole flow of government entitlement works and i mean i think uh in some way or the other uh the the stakeholders involved which is largely the industry has to think more as shared outcomes i think a lot of times my personal observation has been that industry looks at their workers their employees their benefits we've also seen last year we have also started msme work we have now work with msmes and micro entrepreneurs and i think we are we have seen that large scale impact and quick impact because government schemes also has a financial year window every financial year budget change you have to act now act fast something that was mentioned in the video also and i think as industry shared outcomes is very very important you can't be saying that only my workers will get benefits if you're looking at an area it has to be because migrants the one thing that they do have is the freedom to move let it let it be don't restrict them to one place but at the same time i think that's really really important thank you aniket thank you so one one particular system that we're talking about is the entitlements that government provides and the whole industry can can you know play over there but industry has a role to play uh, you know through its business daily run as well rajiv do you want to come in here is there a way to make industry think differently about its day to day runnings because many of our 270 million non agrarian and formal workers actually are impacted by what industry does on a day to day basis because they work here in formally like to come bring you in here and you're on mute rajiv
thank you sonvi am i audible now yeah you know i think sometimes that it is hard to think of positive outcomes from what happened during last year or this year two waves but i think at least a promising one is that there is a group of uh, industries and um, people in the private sector who are seriously considering their relationship with their workforce right and i think that was the seed of what we today know know as social compact which um, is has brought together industry players with organizations with labor organizations like ourselves which basically are coming together to ensure that there is a greater equity and greater dignity for workers who are within industries and they mainstream the idea that responsible business is equal to successful business okay it's not just a csr activity but that if we do good and look after our workers and improve their improve labor standards within and improve labor standards not just not just within our factories and facilities but also in the larger ecosystem then our bottom line will also become will flourish better and will be healthier and i think in that sense the industry uh, the move by several industries and some of who are present on this panel today is a very welcome one one thing that i think we at least people like us understand who are more on the side of uh, civil society and labor activism that it is no longer uh, useful to rely on enforcement legal obligation compliance and law to bring equity and dignity to workers you know that it's it, that is just not sufficient our labor markets are so complex and there are so many systems of that exist to beat law that it is barely sustainable to use law as a means of improving standards and i think it has to come from the logic of uh, uh, labor protection and labor uh, labor services being a good business practice right uh, which is what has brought together uh, a set of industries in pune amdavad mumbai with organizations like us and what we what we what we are what is holding us together is some consensus on what needs to change and this consensus is arising from our shared experience of the pandemic last year especially you know that was reflected in the video that you showed you know that at least what should be due to our workers what should be non negotiable for the workers of this country regardless of their formality regardless of their relationship with the principal employer what should they, what is it that they every must everybody must be able to access so we agreed upon jointly we agreed upon six standards okay and these standards have to do are around wages that we make sure that all workers have at least a living wage so that they are not forced to work um, you know uh, on border lines you know kind of threshold level wages we agree upon health conditions that all workers must be healthy must have access to healthcare um we agree upon um, safety in at a workplace you know india has some of the most dangerous work conditions you know for work as the number of accidents and deaths on workplace are possibly the highest anywhere in the world and a lot of these are also undocumented by the way so how can we make sure that workers have safety around them and at the places of work we make sure that gender is gender parity so there is equality of of opportunity and especially in terms of wages between men and women in the work they do and uh, there is uh, uh, access to entitlements and that there is a point that both nalini and aniket have already made that you know entitlements in our in our country are not portable they are very restricted by domicile and if we free up that we universalize that we make sure that there is public provisioning and services available to all workers regardless of where they come from and that would make you know their uh, experience at work and the outcomes for them and for industry very superior so we agree upon access to entitlements and finally we agree upon the idea that everybody must have must be able to participate in the future of work which is that all workers must have opportunity opportunities to be skilled up and to participate in the growth story that india claims to represent so these six standards zone we are what social compact is championing and um, a good thing is that this is being done not just for on roll workers 
in any case bigger industries are anyway maintaining full compliance there is a lot of industries that we that we go to uh, are already gold standard in terms of what they do to their workers but the situation changes quickly when you go to contract workers or you go to casually employed workers or workers in the supply chain right and i think it is to that landscape that our attention must turn to the workers on the streets last year were not workers who were who were being looked after as permanent uh, you know um, uh, enabled kind of you know on roll staff there were people in the supply chain there were people who were living within small construction sites or on site in manufacturing spaces there were uh, work that was a workforce that was without housing without sanitation without food access that's the larger workforce that we are talking about and i think it is it is to that segment that industry attention is now turning and uh, i and 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 it's a very welcome move because as as i said that if there is shared understanding that we can do this together industry may not be able to do this by itself and we certainly have not been we will not be able to enter industry spaces by ourselves right so for us to come together makes a lot of sense we already have a start in uh, pune and in amdavad and also in mumbai in um, you know farad is here and thanks to uh, forbes marshall and other companies coming together there is already a worker facilitation center that is active in chakran in pune in amdavad we are working amdavad and baroda we are working with industries association and i am happy to see that this we have reached almost about 25000 workers you know just in the last few last few months almost 40 companies are either already enrolled or 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 have started to make the journey to assess their own practices vis-a-vis -vis the standards that i mentioned and if they feel that they need to correct take some remedial action then we are happy to work with them and uh, uh, help them kind of we make this journey to remedial to improve conditions not just within but also in their ecosystem you know let me just close by saying that industry has a lot of power yeah they um, they have power in spaces where government is likely to not exercise power okay they have power over governments and i think if we were to show how uh, the system can work differently for informal migrant casual workers um i think they if the bigger industries pick it up then these smaller players would absolutely uh, see it as something desirable and i think the little experiment that we are now on which dasra ourselves and several industries who are partnering i hope it becomes a reality to take it to millions of workers across the country because let's keep in mind informality is not going to go away in the any time soon okay and therefore we have to create systems and services that bring minimum levels not just minimum fair levels of um, services and dignity and rights to workers and we should do this together thank you very much thanks rajiv what you said made me think right it's all about what nalini aniket and you are saying is essentially treat them as human beings can we be human centric about also this population of 300 million that's right at the bottom and is often considered as zero value add uh, totally re replaceable all of us i think are replaceable to some extent right i mean let's not kid ourselves but that doesn't mean that we have to choose between paying our children's school fee and falling sick you know that's not the level of 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 negotiation we have to do on a daily basis just because we may be uh replaceable so i think this is a call to various stakeholders to remember what happened last year to we realized the mutual dependence on the 300 million things did shut down we did have to you know all of us scribbled at home in our businesses in government offices that there weren't people to do the basic things that we took for granted so every time i think we consider this 300 million to be totally worthless uh let's remember the pandemic let's remember the dependence and let's revive the ability to treat them like human beings i think from there starts the journey of endless corrections and improvements and i'd like to on this in fact note bring in namrita uh, namrita godrej properties is in fact both leveraging its business practices as well as its csr to bring greater dignity to 
you know, workers in the construction space. Could you tell us a little more about that? We can't hear you very well, Namrata. Could you be louder, please? Do let me know if, if, uh, if you can hear me. Otherwise, let me try one setting. Is this better? Uh, could you try again? Try again. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Don't worry about it. realize uh, where we where some of our efforts had led to the world it's good to be able to talk about it in a common forum um, microphones help uh, headphone changes yeah. help so so good about that and thank you for your patience uh, letting me do this uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that i you know i really would take away from from the conversations that we've been having so far is that, um, yes, um, companies have choices, companies have, um, are able to effect change. Uh, from our part, we, as part of a group, and a lot of our big picture things have started off at a group level, have always sort of looked at uh, worker welfare, worker dignity from that lens. Uh, compared to our factory setups, we are, of course, different. We are a real estate company where we land up being the principal employer, which means that we have contractors on board and we don't directly employ the construction worker. That said, uh, the person who builds our homes is very much a, a part of our aspiration journey. One of the things that it has been um, a pleasure to work with, uh, with your teams has been on the report, uh, which is to look at how does this worker uh, treat real estate as more of an aspiration se sector? How does the ecosystem evolve? But getting to that, starting off with what we look at uh, within our company and to the question that you asked. Uh, for us, um, we have looked at sustainability and worker welfare as a core part of that through two lenses. One is our ESG performance, and performance is the right word to talk about it because you have to get better at it year on year. Uh, it is something that, that has to sort of, you know, um, you have to be able to record uh, inferences on that. And the other that you correctly mentioned is the CSR impact. Uh, at Godrish Properties, we've taken a framework approach which has helped us out, and we've tried to interlink uh, everything within that. So our worker workforce is a part of one of our pillars, which is people. And uh, it goes to some of the conversations that we've been hearing right now of how important these folks are. So for us, uh, who, who is this person who is an informal migrant worker on one of our construction sites? He's very much a contributor to what we build. Um, did you know for that matter that worker strength is one of our proxies for company productivity across our company, which means that our company tracks worker strength across each and every one of our sites at a daily level with a report that comes out that says on this site, you know, worker strength went up to 5,000, worker strength, you know, went down to 4,500. As of today, we have 20,000, a little more than 20, 20,670 people working on our construction sites. And these are people with whom we are building the buildings that we are, that we take out to the market. Our aspiration as a company has been to be amongst the world's most sustainable and responsible developers. It isn't just, you know, isn't just sustainability from a pure play environmental perspective. Uh, what we found back in when we got started was that if we were to link every part of what a construction worker's um, life cycle is with key components within our business, um, that would allow us to jump forward from pure play compliance into governance. We just spoke about that government mandates and laws are not the only way to actually affect um, societal change or company level change or ecosystem level change. That said, they do provide an impetus. So one of the first things that we did uh, a while back was to audit what was our level of compliance. Was it compliance 
or was it using compliance to move the needle and to document our moving the needle? And therefore, we talk about a term called governance. Governance in our uh, aspect is to take anything that is mandated by compliance and then show uh, repetitive uh, and consistent improvement over parameters over time. And with doing that, and by incorporating workers into our existing ISO related system, what sort of systems are we talking about? So the worker comes to work. So his health and safety at the workplace is important. So that system is occupational health and safety. That ensures that some of the things that we saw in the video, whether it had to do with health insurance, whether it had to do with being taken care of should you have you know, a, a grievous accident on a site, are all sorted for within the system. The other aspect is uh, what we call our environmental management system, which actually picks up on their uh, bigger ecosystem, which is the labor camps they stay in, the creches that the children that are with them in the labor camps, if they are in, in those cases, how do we take care of that? So by incorporating worker welfare into existing process-based systems and strengthening those gaps was a way that we found that we could use our machinery, which is you know huge and scale. Just to give you a reference, we're a large developer. We have 153 million square feet under development. For us, and we have at any given date about of, as of this morning, 49 operational sites. Now, these sites, every time we sign a project, get added to. If we make incremental changes on every site and every domain, then we are able to effectively do this further. That was something that we were doing. Um, what has been very nice is to work with the teams and especially pick up the social compact indicators because that allowed us for the first time to go back and review some levels of our extensive dashboards and say, hey, we, were we even asking the question? To give you a simple perspective, there are six major uh, indicators, right? Gender is one of them. We looked at workers very agnostically. There was worker strength being recorded. We started now mandating every site to provide data, which was women and men, which was separated. And lo and behold, for me, not very nice to hear, only 2% of our entire workforce is women. Are we doing enough? Are we doing anything? What are we doing? And what are some of those gaps? So we took the indicators and we looked at not just to pat ourselves on the back saying that, okay, on wages, we were it was working, not just compliance, even on site, it seemed to work. Um, health, we were doing a decent enough job. There were worker camps happening, you know, rip, eye checkups were happening, their own health needs were being taken care of. Entitlements, I will come to a little bit of that through some bit of our CSR work. We'd gotten started on it. But the two big areas that came out for us were, were we doing enough for gender? Were we doing what was for the future of the workforce? And the second thing, again, coming back is, right now, real estate is a very... Um, increasingly getting skilled, but it isn't, I mean, if we were to look at the developed country and ours, the construction workforce does in, enjoy a certain degree of acceptance. They know what their jobs is. There is growth, there is security. Now we are far way away from it, but can we make some incremental leaps? Can we bridge those gaps? And therefore the idea of the future of work and hence are putting in any sort of uh, you know elements that we can to make sure that that is continuously strengthened. It will not take, happen through us. It'll happen through us. And we use every mechanism that business allows us to do. So our contract documents, our compliance requirements, our governance needs. So if we just embed a idea and then make it everyone's job and then sort of measure the indicators, uh, how did the social compact help us? A, it allows us allowed us to go back and check with a very agnostic framework. It allowed us to check that, look, you, you feel you're doing a good enough job, but here are clear blind spots or areas where we may not have paid enough attention. It also gave us some, at least our teams on ground, some credibility to say that, yes, on an, you know, on an indicator which, which we are trying to adopt and we are trying to talk about, yes, there are some things that are working, which is good, but it's a lot better for us to understand what the blind spots are and in order to take that further.
One thing I will want to mention is that every business has to find a way of harnessing the power within the business. We are at the last count 1830 employees. That will be a lot stronger than our small sustainability teams. So if we are able to harness where the business is, is moving, and in that we use sustainability reporting as the wind we were attempting to harness. Um, the teams at Tasra helped us out by taking the social compact and mapping it to indicators that we were already reporting on. These are real estate benchmarks, which are ESG benchmarks. Key uh, amongst these are uh, GRESP, that is CRISPY, um, DGSI, which is across a lot of sectors. We also map um, our sustainability reports to GRI standards. We have the SA 1000, which is the social accountability standards, the ILO commitments. So by doing this, we were able to go back to individual teams, were their operations, if they were compliance, if they were our internal risk management teams, and then talk about workers as an asset, as a resource. And we were able to therefore plug into various other initiatives that were ongoing within the company. It hasn't been long since we started this. It's been this financial. Uh, we embarked upon a fairly large sustainability roadmap about a year and a half back. So the first year was just getting our basics sorted. Uh, uh, and this was building on, of course, a, a huge wealth of work that our teams have previously done over the last 10, 20, 25 years on doing this. But this year, it is our fundamental focus to make sure that we map it to the best in class externally. So we make everybody now accountable to fill in these data points. So we have internal audits, which are spot audits to a labor camp. Uh, our operational teams are obviously not hugely pleased that someone can just walk into a labor camp and then start filling in, you know, what is the quality of, of everything that is provided there. But that does help. So doing this sort of very metric oriented and value oriented. The reason I say metric and values combined is use existing metrics and then continuously show improvement. So you're able to keep the teams enthused and engaged. And the other one is value based. So if anyone were to ever say that, look, we're not able to build quick enough, or we have this gap, and maybe we should set up a precast factory. Our job fundamentally is to say that, you know, let, what is the quality of investment that you're thinking about? Can we instead, you know, look at a uh, skilled workforce? These are some of the gaps. We may not then fill them right now, but to a five-year, 10-year horizon, is there yeah. different ways of doing things? So in every sort of business discussion, to talk about the worker, not somebody that you're just doing something good for, right? Oh, you know, yeah. this is a worker. Let's just give them some food aid. Let's do that. Why? These are the 20,000 yeah. people who are building our homes. These are yeah. as valuable assets to us as the employees. And we are a very employee-centric organization. But this yeah. way of thinking is, you know, it needs to be seeded in. And we are very, very grateful for the level of management support. We have a ESG committee at GPL, which is an environmental, social, and gov uh, governance space committee, which has our CFO on board, which is chaired by our chief sustainability officer, which has our chief legal officer, our compliance officers, our risk management officers. So just using a, a, the ability to take some of these small interventions to them by pivoting every conversation to look at the worker was, workforce as a means and mechanism to be a huge contributor to our company's aspirations and therefore give back to the system. So, you know, uh, when we did some of these uh, social uh, compact studies, uh, we found that not, not everybody just wanted to uh, attend a course for skilling. They oftentimes, and we got this across several of our sites, and we are now effectively trying to see what we can do of it, is they have learned on the job. So can they get a certification so that if they move out from our site, that it's almost like, a, like when we leave an organization, we carry a Right? Yeah. Why would we yeah. not do that for the worker? Mm -hmm. And these are not things that we can solve easily or urgently or just for a compliance day. These are big picture changes that it will take us effort and will take us, you know, thoughts, inputs, guidance, ecosystem support, you know, engagement from all of you on the call today. But 
we effectively would like to use every function, every system, every process, anything that we can do to embed our ESG performance culture. Um, on a yes. lighter note, I wanted to mention that every site has an EMS box for us. Every team uh, buys very hard at GPL to win a end of the year chairman sustainability award. And worker related metrics uh, make up, uh, you know, 40% of the scoring criteria. Mm -hmm. So what this does is it makes everybody a doer and you're yeah. not restricting it to a function or you're not saying that CSR spends is how we take care of our workforce. So yeah. yeah. If, if, if that you. provides some context, then that's what um, mm -hmm. we'd like to talk about. No, that definitely, definitely. I mean, bringing the power, full power of the worker to the business and bringing the full power of the business to the worker. Um, Namrita, you spoke about integrating social compact and its metrics, its value system into a pretty complex and large machinery. Virendra, I want to bring you in. Forbes Marshall started integrating the same into its supply chains, again, something that a lot of people find a daunting thought process. So you want to tell us a little more about why and how you went about it? Sure, Sonvi. Thank you. Um, I think uh, several years ago, uh, through the family business network, we were quite aligned to the SDG goals of the UN. And uh, we used to work with our supply chain, mainly about the sustainability oh. angle. And this was about you know, Please. water management, waste management, uh, and various energy consumption parameters, all the while, while we were doing that in our own plant. Last year, when uh, the crisis hit, I think it threw a big spotlight on the situation of health and how do you manage health for, for the workers. Now, please uh, understand our uh, vendor base is, has a lot of migrants in it. Okay, the nature of the industry, which is metalworking or fabrication, has a lot of migrants in it. So before we went there, uh, how, well, that was much later, of course. But at the beginning of last year, when we decided to take care of our own workers here, we also communicated with our vendors uh, and said, look, uh, cash flow will not be a problem. We will ensure your payments come through. But bear with us, only supply us as and when we tell you to supply, we are not cancelling orders. So in a sense, we first started building that uh, clarity to them that uh, we are there with you. And uh, subsequently, when the social compact came along, it became a very good opportunity to really work with them on the social aspects. Now, when we uh, take a vendor on board, we certainly have a vendor approval process which takes into account whether they are covered for health and insurance, et cetera. However, what we find is that since it's got so many migrant uh, workers there, a lot of them are moving. And as someone mentioned on the call, that's not something which we can control. That's not something which we should try to control. However, can we have an umbrella approach to take care of them? So right again, we first took took a look at our own uh, contractors who are directly there working with us. And we found that, yes, there were a set of things that we are doing, which uh, maybe would be worth us looking at, uh, at our vendors. Um, so we went, we went about putting together a, a format to understand what is needed. And of course, a lot of companies like yourself, uh, Ajivika Bureau, et cetera, uh, all of us uh, were enabled through you all. And when we started getting the data in from these eight vendors, and it, it's a, it covers the entire spectrum of our vendor base, uh, most of them from within Pune because things were tough at that time, some of them outside Pune, we found that the picture was actually a lot more challenging than it appeared to be. Now, during the first lockdown, many of them uh, really took care of their people. However, since many people, there would be roughly about a 50-50 split or a 50-60 split of people who are on roles and people who are uh, contracted. So many of those people had moved out. And they moved out not because they were ill-treated, but because there was so much uncertainty. Now, what did this mean? 
that if any of their workers had, had contracted the virus, it meant a lot of expense. And uh, I think earlier, Aniket mentioned that the information across the board is very sketchy. It's also uh, played with and uh, used by various entities in the market. So, so therefore, then we had to we had to come to some kind of a standard, and we went about it with our own consultant to understand how to go about it, and we really narrowed it down to looking at uh, health, um, uh, the safety, and basically skilling people up to take care of these aspects. So, you know what happens is uh, they understand this, but they say, then what's in it for me? And why do I say this? They have an informal system of uh, supporting the worker, they don't. They don't probably uh, fulfill all the legal obligations, which then their consultant takes care of. But when the worker is going home, they pay him a lump sum. So there is an informal system that is there. But now, when people went into a shutdown, there was no availability of resources. Then the government schemes are what uh, we believe would really add value. <laughs> and currently, what we are taking to the teams is focusing on the ESIC uh, identity, which is called the Pechan card, uh, basis which they can get uh, the, the requirements met from there. Not only that, they have to have certain processes followed, otherwise, the payment doesn't come. You know, it, it's, it's very bureaucratic that way. If, uh, if you meet the requirements, it's, it's just fine. So at present, the sort of focus that we are bringing is uh, interacting with these members, uh, both at the ground level with the workers, as well as the owners, because knowledge at both ends is a little wanting over there. <clears throat> and the recent launching of the WFC, which is the work Worker Facilitation Center, enables us to reach these people and meet with them and understand their problems. Now, it's only through that ground knowledge, ground information, are we able to really make an impact? Because really at that level, what are they worried about? They're worried about, will, will my salary go up? On the other hand, what is the, uh, the owner of the plant worried about? He's only worried about whether his costs will go up. So breaking down these bar barriers and making them understand that this is very, very important towards business continuity, is the focus currently that we are bringing to bear. And uh, also what we found is that many of these people who come to, to work from their villages, they are brought in by their own family members who, are, who had come here and established a base. So the trust circuit has to be understood. It has to be built. The knowledge has to be built. And then only we see that these things are going to start showing a result. So yeah. quite frankly, I think uh, what we are trying to focus on at present is make sure that their health checkups are done on time and uh, different industry segments have a different uh, risk level. So, so the health checkups are taken care of on that basis. And uh, of course, ensuring that we are imparting training, safety being such a major issue in many of these industries, uh, we have embarked upon a program to understand their various uh, industry segments with our own teams yeah. and they are going and carrying out the trainings over there in conjunction with the owners so th there is a shared value there is an importance of a combined approach there which then the people mm -hmm. find it a lot more interesting and 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 you know we have been discussed this in the past and i think there have been lots of uh, uh, good words that have come out from there so I think the current focus is on health, on the government policy for ESIC, <coughs> as well as training. Yeah, yeah. And it is a, these are difficult conversations, right? I mean, a lot of, I remember back in November last year, when we were thinking about the compact, we were really thinking there's no legal obligation for principal employers to take these practices to their supply chain. I mean, it's a, it's a good thing to do. It's not a necessary thing to do. So why take the risk? Has it been a like has it been a risky, ugly kind of a journey, or has it impacted relations in in, in any way? What has it been like? Uh, to be very honest, I think uh, what we have found is many of the vendors they understand this, but their their view is not that they don't want to do it. They, in that respect, they follow the Forbes Marshall philosophy quite well, and it was really nice to see 
even during the first lockdown, that many of them who had the space had billeted the workers within their premises, taking care of their food, etc. So when it comes down to now taking it forward the way we are hoping to take it forward, uh, sometimes the problem is memory is short-lived. Okay, so that was a pandemic. It's over. We are fine. You can see around. Uh, Nobody is really taking too much care. So I think while it's not ugly, uh, we are going to have a lot of work cut out for ourselves to get this mainstreamed. And uh, we hope that uh, with the companies that we are working with, this will indeed happen. So I think I think it'll work. I think it will, but it it it'll require a lot of uh, uh, data as well as. Uh, uh, boots on the ground to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Virendra. Gagan, Virendra spoke about relationships that existed and kind of leveraging them to push out shared values, uh, a common goal, a common mission. Uh, but I want to bring you in to talk about cultivating new relationships and shared value systems out of that. I mean, how has that been for you as an integral part of the social compact? Uh, Center for Social Justice and yourself have been working on this. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Sonvi. I've been listening to um, at least the examples of whom I call business with conscience and empathy, the case studies which have come there. I have been in justice work for the last 40 years and primarily using law and lawyers and paralegals in looking at violations and then use law as a tool for change and for implementation. And um, found it very frustrating because, I mean, and if I give you the big picture, you know, India and the rule of law is 68 out of 126. India in order and security is 111 out of 126. For women and security, it's the worst in the world. Um, it is 133 out of 168. I'm giving shooting these statistics to tell you and investment in the justice system is not even 1% of the budgets of state governments. Um, so you can imagine, so when Aniket was giving a very beautiful picture of how entitlement can work, I know for a fact, because working on it for 30, 40 years, Getting entitlements is just not about filling forms. It's about provisioning, public provisioning, where budgets are not in sync with what is the need. And there's a huge budgetary gap. Um, and therefore, moving from what has been largely an adversarial role and the compact showing that this cannot be a versus, but it has to be together. And that's where I think when people like Farhad and Anuaga and Godrej showed very clearly that we can work together um, and move out of this adversarial role. It was a very, for, for, for us, a game changer to work in that context. Uh, for me, um, entitlements are important. Uh, but if you must recognize that the bulk of the problem is in small and medium-sized industry who are part of the value chain of the large thousand companies who are supposed to be reporting on the ESG. Um, so will those companies just look at my house in order or will they look at it as an ecosystem in order? Um, will they be open like the way Namrata has been talking in Godrej or uh, Virendra talking that they will go beyond what is legal to beyond to what is what I would say support the establishment of rule of law and invest in rule of law. And therefore, if we work together, and I know Farhad has been working with CII, and we are trying here to work with the FICI system to basically say it's good for business to invest in the rule of law. Uh, because in the end, that is where you will also be able to become a global player. I think that's the arguments that we need to build together. If industry is open, then we can support the small and medium-sized industries who are part of the value chain where the bulk of the labor is there 
um, to get their entitlements, um, ensure that governments start budgeting for that, um, work on the policy end together, because if we do it as just civil society, you know, we are taken as irritants in the entire design. But I think when, 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 when business also sees this together, I'm sure we can build a policy environment to work these things through. But more than that, you know, on the ground, the, the whole area of um, distrust, or do we trust that um, is civil society going to go after us? I think building that, um, that trust, I think, is what the social compact brings to the table. Um, and therefore, the need to set up these trustworthy common spaces, um, whether it is in the uh, associations, the industrial associations, and therefore the need for big companies as champions to show that yes, we can work together because it's it's a nation, it's a national problem. I think the question of invisibility is no longer there. Um, because I think the pandemic did just that. And um, as uh, you know, people have been saying, it, it's actually cut open the stomach and the blood and all the filth was out there. So nobody can deny now that there is a problem. Uh, I think that's what the pandemic has done. Let's say it is there hitting us on our face and therefore uh, no one system can deal with it. The, and when we talk to the workers, what were they asking? Um, you know, the new schemes now, they say you get this card and that card. Uh, and then because of the card, you will get schemes. Um, and, you know, I was a little listening to them saying, but, you know, uh, what's there in, in, in getting you a card? Because getting the scheme is going to take you another six months. And what they said is, we want an identity. Um, at least the card will tell me that I am a worker. Uh, till now, I've been a worker for 10 years, getting 10,000 rupees and being th thrown from one to the other, not a single paisa of increase for 10 years. Um, there is food insecurity, and I know this ration card and one ration card business. Have we asked the question, is the provisioning for ration equal to the number of people who are needing that ration. And there is a gap of almost 60% of the budget from where will it come? But if they, one can enable that, it's a huge jump in their actual real income if they get ration card. Health systems. Is the state spending? Actually, it is privatizing health systems. Now, do we need to, and as uh, Virinder said, activate the ESIS, but activating it will mean more public investment. And overarchingly, if you have to also look at the rural migration to, and where is it coming from? It's coming from Chhattisgarh, Charkhand, MP. Who are they? They're largely tribals, Dalits, and we are actually not investing enough in what is called the rain-fed agriculture. We are not making agriculture anywhere equal to livelihood uh, yeah. based. So I think there are two aspects. One, companies and civil society working on giving them their due space as not just workers and as Namrata so beautifully explained, giving them an identity that they are part of the business. Um, and on the other hand, in you know, investing and seeing that public policy um, yeah. uh, and the data that we collect, the experiences that we collect, then is shared. We are, I'm also a little wary of this centralization of things. Um, we are a federal state um, and we need to actually help set up more localized institutions, even at the panchayat level. And that's what, for example, Godrej, uh, not Godrej, uh, uh, the Godrej uh, industry, and we are setting up 
together entitlement centers, which are run by communities. Um, so I think we need to work together. And I'm therefore looking forward to, for example, working with Fiki and some of you as part of it to bring these issues on the table with that yeah. larger frame that we are all investing in a rule of law in this country, which therefore respects citizenship. That yeah. to me is the, is the driving force why I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gagan. So what I'm hearing is Unfortunately, in this country, for the basic dignity of human beings, we need to get out of our silos, our comfort positions, have a few difficult conversations, take a few good risks, right? Otherwise, we are not going to break the ceiling uh, that is kind of on us right now. Talking about risk, Samar, I want to bring you in. Uh, in a developing country, it's a taboo word, right? Any kind of risk is a taboo word. Uh, we want safety nets around everything we do. We want to be with surrounded by hundreds of people so that we feel we are safe. Do you think it's time for India to think about good risks and embrace them? Um, and, and do you see a role for philanthropy in, in that? Okay, sorry, can you hear me? You're a little faint, but we can hear you. Okay. Maybe so. Maybe. Thank you. Uh, you'll have to pick it up, perhaps. Uh, Summer, you'll have to, yeah. You may have to pick okay. up your microphone. Right. Is it, is it better now? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I fully appreciate this. I have to say that uh, listening to speakers who already shared their views before me, I feel both humbled at what I can bring now to the table after everything has been said. Uh, and I also feel a bit intimidated at the huge amount of uh, knowledge, experience, and insight that exists right now on this panel. But I truly appreciate and congratulate, um, you know, particularly industry leaders. I know civil society organizations and leaders like Rajiv have been on the forefront of this for a long time. But to see industry speak a language and talk about workers no longer just as an economic resource, but a human being with, you know, head, heart, uh, feels the empathy that comes along, I think is a, uh, is a very, very positive change and it's very welcome. And I particularly wish to congratulate all the industry uh, leaders who I've heard today, you know, and I want to particularly mention Farhad, uh, Namrata, Viren for their, uh, their views. I'll just say you know, three things in response to, partly in response to your question, Sonvi, and partly, of, you know, something uh, from our own experience at Ford Foundation. One, I think we are on the verge of making history. And I don't say it without any sense of responsibility. Why I say this is because if you look at the predominant business model that has been followed across the world, it's characterized by you know, many things, but two things stand out. One is race to the bottom. So go to where costs are least and labor costs as you know, is part of costs. That's how it has been treated. Now that's the predominant business model. The second part is that this philosophy cuts across developed and developing countries. So you talk of Facebook in the US, you talk of Google in the US, or you talk of many such companies, iPhone manufacturers in Hyderabad recently, for instance, in India. They all share a common philosophy of profit making, cut costs, get labor as part of costs, bring it down to the minimum, attract investments, get maximum returns. Now, this model is now what we are on the verge of challenging with the social compact, I think is a shorthand precisely for changing that narrative that we are all so eloquently spoken of. You know, so in that sense, when we talk of risks, frankly, you know, one way to look at risk is what bigger risk can you take than to look at transforming the very business model that has created the kind of growth and created GDP as God, uh, you know, that we all lived in and that all we, we saw how it crumbled uh, in the face of the pandemic in the last one and a half years. So that's point number one. And I think it's important to underline that, you know, until we are able to change the narrative and the underlying business model, and therefore, look at CSR and social responsibility, not as an aside or as a compliance, 
but as an empathetic responsibility that is integrated into profit making of organizations and companies up until such time real sustainable meaningful change for companies and for workers such that we all begin to share the benefits of growth and not you know create the kind of inequalities that we have through the business models happen so that's the first point the second point i want to say which is a bit related to this is the role of investors investing community in this and i think although when we talk of corporates and companies the role of investors is integrated in that conversation i personally would like to submit that we have to speak of investors a little bit more explicitly than we have done so far it's important to get these group of people you know sensitized it's important for this group of people to begin to realize that profit profit making at the cost of environment people planet is not profit making that's something else and let me not you know venture to venture to, to suggest what terms we could use for that but i think it's important that you know the world the world in this pandemic has realized that this responsibility has to be taken more responsibly than has been so far by the investor community and i want to point out one very su successful story here and that's of chinese investments abroad now we all know that chinese investments in large number of countries abroad have been extremely um, you know they've been wide especially after the belt and road initiative in 2013 they affected many countries chinese have carried their investment their people etc not many people would perhaps have noticed that the un general assembly recently uh, in the un general assembly chinese made chinese government made a strong commitment to stop all coal power based power plant manufacturing uh, investments abroad why did they do it because there was an underlying report published by business and human rights resource council which was funded by many organizations including ford including many other philanthropic organizations on creating the the evidence on creating the advocacy on creating opportunities for companies and investors if it can happen in china frankly we all know there is reason to believe that it's very much possible for it to happen in india and elsewhere the third point i want to make and this is my last point sandeep is uh, you know again very strongly highlighting what others have said especially in india so eloquently and animatedly talked about it moving from compliance to you know what she said moving to a governance model i just feel we you know the empathetic responsibility which is the governance uh, model that she has put essentially the direction in which we have to go to and two things are required for this to happen one the kind of championship together we can approach a collaborative leadership which social compact is 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 a testimony to that and the second is as i said we need to move from csr is as an aside responsibility into uh, responsibility woven into profit making itself thank you again for this opportunity thank you. and i'm so delighted to be here thank you samar thank you for making it uh, farhad we speak spoken of risk we spoken of integration let's come to sustainability i mean globally business and sustainability is being spoken of endlessly but india always feels like it's a very foreign concept should indian businesses family businesses in india really care about it take it seriously um thank you sonvi um let me just say a few things about sustainability in the esgs in the global context and then why is it important also for family businesses particularly family businesses in india as we just heard very eloquently from samar the esg focus has become a very significant issue for all businesses overseas in europe especially uh there's been an increased opinion building particularly after the pandemic where governments have provided substantial levels of stimulus by way of uh financial assistance to private business and as a consequence there's a lot of pressure by governments on private business 
um, largely which is due to public opinion, which is actually putting that political pressure on governments, uh, on the private sector, for business to be more socially responsible, to be more environmentally friendly, and also essentially to address all the ESGs and the social development goals, which uh, have been, you know, sort of articulated and defined. And furthermore, there's now pressure being built by the investment community as well, where large institutional investors are taking positions uh, of restricting investment in certain businesses, etc. And I think Sanmar also spoke about China in terms of what China is doing in terms of its investments and why is it doing this? It's because of, you know, global public opinion. Now, how does this relate to us here in India? The world is a global community today and our Indian businesses are also part of that global community. And as a result, it's not possible to isolate oneself from the global environment and pressures which exist elsewhere, if they have not already been felt, and I think they are already being felt here. Um, and as a result, many Indian companies and multinationals which are operating in India as well, and many socially responsible Indian companies are also taking this on board and feeling that they need to do something about it. Why family business? Well, if you look at the presence of family business in the Indian private sector, it's a very significant element, both in terms of number of businesses and also in terms of the number of people who would be employed. So yes, we have very large non-family businesses that operate in India, but if you look at total employment, if you look at the total impact that can be potentially had, uh, if we can get enough family businesses, family owned businesses on board, we can maximize our impact on society. Furthermore, one of the things in which we, which we deal with in family business is we are relatively tuned to dealing with paradoxes. And I'll come to what I mean by that paradox. Many of our family businesses have been involved with philanthropic activity. Uh, they've been doing this for a long period of time. At the same time, you need to be profitable. You need to be able to justify any social spending, social investments that you're making. So you need to be profitable. And the paradox really is to ensure that we pursue profit, but you also pursue your purpose. You also pursue um, the things that are necessary for social improvement. And that's why I think in, par in family business, if we are used to dealing with paradoxes and we can manage paradoxes, we have to think about profit and purpose. And so you can think about profit and addressing the ESGs as well. And the social compact is really a prime example of how we can address the S part of the ESGs. I don't think, you know, there's been enough spoken already on the horrific conditions that we saw uh, what happened last year. Um, and I think it only highlighted what has existed for so long. And unfortunately, um, while uh, I think, Gagan, I think you mentioned that, well, you know, the stomach has been cut open and it's there for everyone to see. Uh, and so we can't hide from it. It's absolutely right. But I think as things, as time goes on, and as things get back to somewhat more and more a normal situation, I just hope that our memories don't fade. Um, and it's very, very essential that we, we pursue the goals that the social compact has been set up for, and that people like you, Sonvi and Dasra, you keep us on track to see that we make progress and that we actually make a change.
the change needs to happen in terms of whether it's small steps that we take, the small steps to see that, you know, uh, whether it's making the entitlement, entitlements accessible, making small changes in our vendor base, where we see that those few vendors that we directly have control on improve their conditions on all those six parameters that have been identified in the social compact and step by step that we make progress. So it's important that we track it. It's only when you measure that you can improve because you need to have that benchmark of where you stand today. And then you can measure against that to see what improvements need to be made. So I just like to end there because I'm mindful of the time, but uh, happy to take any questions subsequently. But I think it's a great initiative that you've started and we must take it forward. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Farhad. Uh, we in fact have a few questions. Uh, Deepa, you in fact asked us, uh, how are we, what is it that we are doing in the compact? I mean, I'd, I'd invite you to take a look at the website because you're mindful of time, but we've basically the six outcomes that Rajiv spoke about have been converted into 31 concrete standards. Uh, that companies then uh, map their maturity on. It's not a rating, it's a maturity all the way from whether they are, they have the policies in place to support that standard all the way to whether they are reporting and championing the standard. Um, so I'd invite you to, to join, join us in one of these conversations and take a look at the website also to learn a little more about it. Uh, I know we are responding to questions in, in the chat and we are also mindful of time. I'll just take the liberty of summarizing, I think, why this session and, and what's that one or two things that I think all of us want to take away from here. I think we are pushing for treating a very large percentage of our population as a country uh, to be treated as fellow human beings. I think that's point number one. Um, if there is any doubt in our mind about uh, the importance of including them in our shared value uh, stakeholders, I think the pandemic kind of uh, bombed that misconception to some extent. They are critical for our operations. Uh, they may be more in number than a very high skilled white color worker, but they are nevertheless critical for the country to run the way it's running at the price points that it is running, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and once I think we embrace the fact that they are critical, I think then it's about do I have to cut down my profits to give them their basic dignity? I think the answer we are hearing is that's in, your, in our head. That 1%, that 0.5% is not what you want to save to get your profits up by a 1% or a 0.5%. Uh, there is really a larger case to make in the race to the top, or the, at least the journey if race is a bad word to the top that Summer was talking about where there is a clear synergy between the future of business and the future of work in the country. One will be uh, falling short if the other does not keep up. Um, and so if we wanna compete with global markets, if we want to be out there as businesses uh, that are not only known but respected, uh, that have the same footing with investors and the public opinion out there, I think it's about time that we included our informal workers within that business chains as a critical part of our responsibility through business as usual itself and create that a larger mass of people that believe and have lived examples that successful and responsible businesses can coexist. Uh, and it's really quite a myth that the country has to break out of. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, and we hope to continue the conversation please write to us on the website. We'd love to engage with you in whatever capacity you'd like to engage with us within the compact. Thank you all the speakers for your engagement. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sonvi, for anchoring this. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.